tonight, I, I borrowed a title from one of my favorite movies of all time, a movie by Will Smith. It's called Pursuit of Happiness. Pursuit of Happiness. If you haven't seen that movie, you need to see that movie. It's really a wonderful movie, really an excellent movie. I recommend it wholeheartedly. Today I want to share with you from two different sections of the Bible, Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 through 22, and also 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 to 20, 22, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Uh, it's a very short passage. Okay, if you found it, let's read it together. Okay, ready? Let's begin. Store yourself treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, this is a sermon that actually is more for me than it is for you. Maybe it's just as much for me than it is for you. One of the things that I struggle in life is actually, to be honest with you, is being happy. Because by nature, my personality, I am a warrior. Not a warrior, as in fighter. Worry. Worrier. I worry a lot. You know, it's my nature. That's why I have trouble, difficult time sleeping, because I'm constantly thinking and worrying about different things. Usually Saturday is the worst day for me. Why? Because from the beginning of the Saturday morning when I wake up, I'm worrying about church. You know, who's going to come? Who's not going to come? How is the praise going to be? How is the tes testimony going to be like? Did the person that didn't come last week, are they going to come this week? You know, how is it going to be? I'm constantly worrying. And because of it, I don't really enjoy my Saturdays, to be honest with you. And my favorite day, my favorite time is just before, just after, immediately after service ends. Then immediately, you know, I'm like, phew, I'm filled with this great relief. One of the greatest tragedies in life, in my opinion, is wasting time. I'm going to share with you how that is related to what I just shared with you. That is one of the greatest tragedies in life, wasting time. I've said this before in the past, in my past sermons. Because many things in life you can make up and you can continue to do. You can do it in the future. Money. Maybe you didn't make money, a lot of money this time. But you know what? You can make more money next time. Maybe you didn't get to watch football game yesterday, but you can watch football game next week. Maybe you missed out on a baseball game, but you can do that later. There are a lot of things that you can make up and redo. But there's one thing in life that we cannot take back and we cannot go back to, and that is time, possession of time. We can never go back and relive some of the things that we did. I cannot go back to my, you know, to, you know, times back when, you know, when my children was born, even though I cherished that moment. I cannot go back and undo some of the things that I did. I cannot go back and undo some of the times that I wasted. That is why, in my opinion, and it's not just my opinion, I think it's the opinion of many people, one of the greatest tragedies in life is wasting time. But then my question to you is this. What exactly is wasting time? How do you waste time? If you were to ask certain people, they might have a different answer. If you ask my wife, she'll, she'll say, wasting time is sitting in front of television and watching sports for two, three hours. You know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> for some of you, some of the spouses, wasting time is being at work from 6 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock midnight. For some, it's staying in front of computers and playing computer games for four hours. Others, it's talking on the phone for four hours. Other people, it's maybe just sleeping continuously. I'm not talking about you, Sasha. There are many other people that likes to sleep. 
But there are many definitions of, you know, if you were to ask as, as to what is really wasting time, what constitutes wasting time. But contrary to what some of you might think, to me, I don't consider wait, watching television or playing computer games or even sleeping as wasting time. You should say amen, you know, amen. Like all things, if, you, if it's done in moderation, then I think it's okay. And like all things, if what you do brings you pleasure, then it is, to me, a good thing. Doing things that keep, brings you rest and pleasure, it is a good thing. But again, as long as it is done in moderation and with consideration of priorities in life. Did you understand that? Moderation means that you don't do it for four hours, you don't sleep for 12 hours, you, know, you don't work for 20 hours, you don't talk on the phone for eight hours. Moderation in consideration of priorities in life. That means that if there are other important things to do, then sometimes we need to let go of those things. Because for me, to me, watching television for me is not a wasting time. It's a waste of time because I find rest. My wife, my wife always bugs me, honey, why don't you read a good book? And in return, I tell her, why would I want to put myself through torture? <laughs> because I don't enjoy reading, you know. I enjoy reading, but I enjoy reading things that I enjoy, mainly sports, news. I enjoy reading about news and current events. But what brings me rest is sitting in television and watching TV. That's just my personality. But Bible does tell us what wasting time is. In fact, Bible makes it very clear that certain things is really a waste of time. And this is what I want to share with you tonight. And I pray that after we hear this, that really we will rethink as to how we are to live our lives. Because it has made me rethink about my life this week. One way Bible tells us that we are wasting time is when we focus our lives, when we fall into temptation of devoting all our energy and time in building wealth. Now, I'm not trying to say this because I know so many people here work hard a lot and studying a lot to make lots of money, and I'm not trying to criticize all of you. But sometimes we can easily fall into the temptation where we devote almost entire, our entire energy and time in trying to build wealth. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 says, Store yourself in heaven, in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. There's another passage in the Bible that says sim, uh, similar things. It says, Don't store, off, store for yourself treasures that can be destroyed. What God is saying is this, it is waste of time, it is meaningless for us, to, for us to devote our entire life, our entire energy on things that is not eternal. Money is not eternal. House is not eternal. Your job is not eternal. Why? Because the moment you die, all of that disappears. If you think that you can take all your money after, you know, to afterlife, then you know what? you're in for a big surprise because that just isn't going to happen. And for us to devote our entire life and energy on things that we know that is not eternal, it is simply a waste of time. And for us to devote our entire energy into that, to me, is tragedy. It's tragic. You know, it's like, it reminded me of a story when I was younger. And it's happened to me on a couple of occasions. Maybe some of you students can, uh, you know, can relate to this. I don't exactly remember the year. To be honest with you, I don't exactly remember the subject matter. I'm guessing, I think it was one of the science subjects. Uh, because I skipped lots of classes when I was in college. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was before I met God. Okay, I would skip classes and what I would do is I would just show up on the day of the exam. And I would often, you know, look at the syllabus where it tells you, you know, we're studying this, 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 this. And then during the test, I just assume 
I followed the syllabus and I said, okay, we're going to be studying chapter 5, 6, and 7, and the test will cover those things. So just before the exam, I would study, you know, I would cram, you know, the night before for like six, seven hours trying to read almost like, you know, a month and a half worth, worth of material. And I would study, study, study. And on the day of the test, I took the test, and, and lo and behold, I didn't know any of the questions, nor the answers for that matter. And the reason being was that the professor changed the chapters, changed the lessons, and I studied the whole night all the wrong chapters. What a waste. You know, it would have been nice if the professor said, you know what, Paul, I'm going to reward you for your mistake because at least you tried. So even though you didn't study the right chapters, I'll give you some bonus points. That doesn't happen. And that doesn't happen with God. It's foolish for us to think that, you know, God's going to understand. Because I tried. I tried and I worked hard. I studied hard. Even though maybe my priorities were wrong, I tried hard. I worked hard. Once I get to heaven, surely God will understand. It doesn't work that way. Either we are on the right path or we are on the wrong path. When that day comes, when we stand before God in judgment, there will be no bonus points, bonus questions, or extra credit. Because all the accomplishments and accolades we build on earth will ultimately fade away. It is not eternal. Only way not to waste time is to build things that are eternal. And the only thing that is eternal is relationship with God. Second way in which most of us end up wasting time. First is devoting our time and energy on things that are not eternal. And the second thing is this, and this is the part that really spoke to me, is not enjoying life. We are wasting our time. It is almost tragic when we live our lives not enjoying life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18 through 18 says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but God says, My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That is God's purpose for our lives. To simply put, to enjoy the life that God's given us. What I'm not saying is this. It's for you to go out and sell all your wealth and start saying, you know what, I need to enjoy my life. I need to live my life to the fullest. So you know what, next Saturday, next weekend, I'm going to go and I'm going to do skydiving. I've never done that before. You know, I'm going to put on a parachute, jump off an airplane, and And the week after that, I'm going to go bungee jumping. I'm going to tie a rubber band to my ankle. I'm going to jump off a tall building. Because life is short. I need to enjoy life. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I'm saying exactly the opposite. Enjoying life, in fact, it means to appreciate and enjoy everyday life. To enjoy life means to enjoy the simple blessings of everyday life that God's given us. The problem is that too often we think that enjoying life means is to do something exciting, do something special. And that's just not true. In fact, people who seek and need thrills and events in their lives to make their lives feel more interesting or meaningful... In fact, those people actually enjoy their lives less. Why? Because when we rely on special events, when we rely on thrills in life to feel alive, that means that we, are, we do not, we have not yet learned to enjoy the simple pleasures of everyday life. 
Just to give you an idea, this past summer I went to Korea. I mean, I went back to America, and let me tell you something. I was counting down the days: 30, 29, 28, 27. And all throughout, the only thing that I could imagine was what I was going through, what I was going to do, you know, once I get to America. I couldn't wait to see my, some of my old friends. I couldn't wait to see how much my nieces and nephews have grown up. I couldn't wait to, you know, go on a family vacation to celebrate my mother's 70th birthday. But the problem was this. When we rely and depend so much on certain things in the future, you know what happened? the present becomes less enjoyable. The present just becomes more of a burden and an obstacle. See, we don't enjoy tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow is only just another day, an obstacle that stands in our way from attaining something that is good. Do you understand my point? When we rely so much on certain events, on certain activities, on certain days, what happens? We neglect to enjoy the today and the present. To enjoy life does not mean that, you know, go out and seek thrills and go out, constantly go on vacations and we have to do this and do that and stay busy. That's not enjoying life. In fact, it is just the opposite. In my younger days, in my 20s, I used to complain a lot about my life in Houston. For those of you who's lived in Houston, and a few of you have, you can understand I would often tell myself, God, why am I living in the boringest city in America? Why am I living in the ugliest city in America? Houston is very hot. But not only is it hot, it is also very flat. Not only is it very flat, it's also very dry and dusty. Not only is it very dry and dusty, the ocean is, is more of a, <laughs> it's more like a, a, a polluted uh, water tank. And I would say, you know, God, why am I, you know, do, why am I living here? Why couldn't I be in a place like Southern California where they have nice 60, 70 degrees Fahrenheit weather year round? Why couldn't I be in New York where they have tall buildings and, you know, all the lights and glitz and so many things to do. You know, they have the Times Square. You can see all these different Broadway plays. They have all these, you know, nice restaurants and many Korean restaurants and cafes and so many places to go, so many places to see. And I would complain, oh, my boring life in Houston. Going to church every day, you know, not that it was bad, but just the routine of get up, go to church, and then go home, eat my, you know, go home to my parents' house, eat my sister-in-law's cooking, and then next day get up and go to school, I mean go to church, and, and same thing again, and then prepare a sermon. Not that those were good, but after a while, I was getting a little bit tired of the routine. And I said, God, I don't like this routine. God, I want some excitement in my life. Well, at the age of 31, I got married to my beautiful, lovely wife, Esther. And that was a good thing, but my routine had not changed. Get up early in the morning, go to church. Instead of going to my parents' house, now I came to my house and my wife's cooking. And next day I go, same thing. And I said, still, I'm saying, God, the same old routine. And I would crave and I would desire maybe something exciting in my life. Not the same old things. But then something sad happened. Something sad happened in our family. Esther's mom, my wife's mother, um, she was a diabetic. And after we had gotten married, her condition got worse where she needed to have dialysis, where, you know, you go to hospital, you get hooked up. They actually built, in, built something into your body. I forgot, was it on the neck? And then they hook things up, 
and they would have to recycle your blood. It's a very uh, uncomfortable thing. But what made it worse was that my mother-in-law was a Korean citizen just visiting. And she, would, she did not qualify for health care in Korea, I mean in America. And because of it, we couldn't go to the hospital to get her the regular treatment for dialysis because to do so would cost us literally thousands of dollars. And we just didn't have the money. So what we had to do instead was, you know, it was really a sad thing, but we really had to wait until my, our mother-in-law's condition got bad. Because, in, you know, a good thing about America is that uh, if you have, if your condition is serious, where it, it's almost life-threatening, hospitals has to treat you by law. Whether you're a U.S. citizen, whether you're a criminal, whether you're a legal alien, it doesn't matter. If your condition is very serious, you, ha you take them to the emergency room, and they have to treat you by law. So because of our finance situation and because of my mother's situation, we would oftentimes have to wait until her condition got bad. And then we would take her to the emergency room. And it wasn't just simple. Oftentimes, you know, she would get really sick in the middle of the night. And I can't tell you how many times, and my wife at that time was like six, seven, eight months pregnant. And with her, you know, big stomach. And, and for me, I get up early to go to church. But many times, we had to take our mother-in-law to the emergency room at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. And sometimes, on many, many occasions, 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. And the whole process of getting a treatment, it, it's not like a one or two hour. Even just getting to the emergency room and filling out the paperwork, same paperwork, every visit, that in itself took about an hour. And then waiting, and then getting the treatment and waiting. It was oftentimes four, five, maybe six hour, uh, you, know, you know, trek or event. And I remember as we were going through that, you know, I felt bad for my wife. But after doing that for several times, in the span of you know a couple of months, waiting in the you know waiting room at the emergency room, dozing off, watching, looking at my watch and seeing that it is four o'clock in the morning, and having to having to done that for about a month and a half. In my heart, I long for that routine. How I long for those days where I could just go to bed at eleven and twelve o'clock at night and get up at 6 or 6.30 in the morning. How I long for that routine where I could just simply come home and eat dinner and not worry about what I have to do next. How I long for those routine where I could just, you know, I could schedule and plan my events without worrying about whether my mother-in-law has to go to hospital. How I long for those days where I didn't have to worry about my wife staying in the emergency room all night being seven, eight months pregnant. How I long for the blessings of those everyday, simple routines of life. You see, so often we fall into this temptation where we rely and we seek so much on special events, on thrills for joy, for happiness in life. And what we have failed to realize is that the real blessings, the real blessings are in everyday, everyday simple pleasures of life. And unless we learn to really enjoy that, we're wasting our life. And that is one of the greatest tragedies, in my opinion, of life. Enjoy the simple blessings of sleeping in our own bed. Enjoying the simple blessings of eating home-cooked meal every day. Enjoying the simple blessings of hearing the laughters of your children. The simple blessings of not worrying about finding a job. Enjoy the simple blessings of going to work every day. Seeing your co-workers every day. The simple blessings of not being sick, not being hurt, 
Simple blessings of going grocery shopping with your family. Simple blessings of having a roof over your head each and every day. Simple blessings of being able to attend school. Simple blessings of finding and having this wonderful church. Don't wait until it's taken away from you for you to appreciate these simple blessings of everyday life. A simple change in perspective. It changes everything, doesn't it? So really key for us to enjoy life, like many things, to enjoy life, to enjoy life is to change our perspective. Well, then how do we, how do we change our perspective? What can we do? Well, the same passage gives us the answer as to how we can change our perspective. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22 says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. And this passage makes so much sense when you really think about it. In other words, what, the, what God is telling us is this. Our God, our eye is the gateway to our heart. What we see determines how we feel in our hearts. It is simple as that. Do you know in life, do you know really what is the most, one of the most influential, influential and powerful things are? In my opinion, it is television and internet in today's culture. It's television and internet. Why? Because they greatly influence what we see. Now, if you don't watch television, that's fine. But millions of people in Korea and billions of people all over the world spend two, three hours average watching television. And because of it, they determine, they're very influential because they determine what millions and billions of people see. And again, I say, what we see affects the desires of our hearts. You know, I don't do this anymore, but when I was in America, one of my favorite hobbies, hobbies were to browse the internet, but more specifically, browsing real estate listings. I would oftentimes go in and look at real estate listings and homes that are on sale. You know, and when you go into that site, they show you different homes. And not only do they show different homes, but they show floor plans and designs. For me, I, I really enjoy that. And I cannot explain to you why. But I've always enjoyed that. Even when I was younger, I would actually draw up my own house. I would draw up a floor plan and say, you know what? When I grow up, I'm going to build my own house. And I'm going to put a living room here. I would do all these things. And even till this day, I do that sometimes. And I find, that, I find great pleasure in that. So even in America, I would oftentimes go into real estate listings. I would go into maybe home builders, KB homes, and I, all these, I, I can't rem recall the names. But I would go in and I would see what kind of floor plans. And, and you can ask my wife, sometimes we drive around and they have model homes. And we would go in simply just to look at the model homes. I really enjoy that. But here was the problem. Here's the problem. Every time I look at these model homes, every time I looked at the floor plans, guess what? Guess what begins to fill my heart? Desire to get a better house. Desire to get a bigger house. You know, in America, I lived in a very nice home. Living in Houston, Texas, where home prices are so low. And again, I am not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. But in, in Houston, Texas, you can buy a brand new 2,000 plus square feet home, that's about 70, 80 pyeong home with front and backyard, two car garage, four bedroom, two and a half bath, living room, dining room, family room, fireplace, all that for hundred and less than $150,000, which is unheard of in any other parts of America. So I lived in a very nice home. That was my house I just described. I didn't buy it. I borrowed money from the bank with a deposit, and I was making monthly payments. But it was a very nice house. 
It's the best house I lived in, you know, since we got married. And yet every time I go into the internet and I look at these brand new homes, and they have a backyard, they have a deck, and a marble, you know, kitchen counter. And I look at the, the, the bathroom with bigger showers, you know, a bathtub with whirlpool bubble making, you know, machine. In a walk-in closet where it's, it's just so beautiful. And the more I look at these things, and my wife, I used to drive my wife crazy. I would say, honey, let's move. <laughs> it's like, we can't afford it. We can, we can. <laughs> if we save more, we can raise our monthly payment for another $100, $200, and we can. And, but here was the bad thing. The more I looked at these types of homes, the less I enjoyed my home. When I first moved into my house, I would say, wow, this is a nice house. I'm so happy to walk in in this nice living room. Look at that fireplace. But when I started looking at all these different homes, better homes, bigger homes, more expensive homes, all of a sudden I look at these things and they no longer seem very attractive. And I didn't enjoy my fireplace, the beauty of it, as much. I didn't enjoy my living room. I didn't enjoy the kitchen. And whenever I looked at the bathroom, it wasn't with the same thrill. Not that it was gonna, I was going to be excited all the time, but it was much less joy. And I wasn't enjoying my house. You see, we can control our perspective by controlling what we see. Because the Bible tells us our eyes are the gateway to our hearts. What we see affects the desires of our hearts. We watch television, all of a sudden, in the middle of the winter, all of a sudden, you see this commercial for vacation to Cancun, Mexico, or, or Philippines, or down where we're in South Thailand, you know, beautiful white sandy beach, and beautiful women, and people sitting down in their couch drinking margarita, and all of a sudden, living in Korea no longer seems fun. We're sitting down and we watch television and all of a sudden you see this you know, good-looking actor driving this fancy car. And all of a sudden, your car no longer seems that impressive. What we see controls the desires of our hearts. So in order to control our perspective, we need to control what we see and what we watch. Back in America, I had a couple of high school students at our church. And I tell you, those two were two of my favorites. Their, their name was Sam and David. Sam and David were, they were very unique and special. Their mother passed away a while, and their father was a pastor. But in, in a Christian culture, especially in a Christian culture in America, it's hard for a single father to find a church position pastor as a senior pastor because there are a lot of females at church. And it's, in most churches, they want a pastor who has a wife. And if you don't have a wife, it's hard to find a senior pastor position. And Sam and David's father was a pastor, but he couldn't find a senior pastor position even though he was in his 50s. So he had to work most of his life as an associate pastor, maybe a part-time pastor. And he was a very poor man. And they lived their life, really, uh, with very little means in their lives. They never lived, you know, they never owned a home, always lived, from, you know, from apartment, small apartment to another, paying rent. They never experienced driving a brand new car in their lives. They never went on vacation to fancy places like Cancun, Mexico, or Korea, or any else, you know, any place like that for that matter. Oftentimes, their vacation is maybe, you know, once every two, three years, driving to Chicago where they had their grandfather. Even though it, their situation, their life situation was like that. What really surprised me and blessed me was that these two young men never complained never whined about their situation, never complained and whined about what they didn't have. In fact, just the opposite. They were so grateful. They were so happy. And they almost enjoyed almost every little thing in life. 
Sometimes I would offer them and say, I would, you know, invite them over and say, hey, you know, eat at my house. And they just like are thrilled because they get to eat Korean food because they don't get to eat that too often at their home. I would take them on a church retreat at a very, you know, retreat at a very, you know, we kind of rough it. They have to sleep on bunk houses and, and so forth. And, you know, uh, they don't, you know, they don't have, sometimes they don't have hot shower. While some of the other kids might complain, these two kids are loving it. Say, oh, this is so fun. This is so great. In fact, what really blessed me was that almost every moment, almost every time I would see them and, and observe them, they're constantly happy. They enjoy almost every little thing in life. They say, hey, man, you know, we're gonna, let's have a sleepover, and there's only a couple of couches in our lounge, and therefore some of you, hey, David, Sam, since you're the boys, you're the older boys, I think you guys should sleep on the floor. And they're like, oh, great. Oh, man, I love sleeping on the floor. I'm like, oh, good. It's like, hey, guys, we don't have much time. Everybody, you have to take all take five-minute showers. I'm like, oh, Sam and David, oh, man, I've done that before. I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they really blessed me because they really learned. They enjoyed every aspect of life. And, I've, and as a pastor, I always wonder, whenever I see people like that, I said, you know, what made them this way? And after I got to know them, talking to them, getting to know them for a while, I understood why. I understood why they had such a wonderful attitude about everything. It was because of their father. They told me that when they were younger, ever since they were in elementary school, for six, seven years straight, they said their father would oftentimes take them, and I, I try to remember the name, but I couldn't remember the name. But it's about 40 minutes outside of Houston, and they have a little, it's a shelter area where all the children of broken homes, I guess, go there to live. They have a special shelter where children of parents who are drug addicts, young children, they would take them out of their homes because the drug addicts, they didn't know how to take care of their children. In fact, they would starve them because they're so high from their drugs and they spend all their money on buying drugs and they neglect their children. So when they find them, they take children out and put them into this shelter until the parents get their lives straightened up. Also, of children whose parents are in jail. They have no place to go. So they will put them in this shelter. And they have all these adults that come and live with them and take care of them. I forgot what it's called. I've been there several times too. And Sam and David told me that ever since they were like in second and third grade, almost once a week, regularly, almost every week, their father would take them to that shelter for years, every week. And in that shelter, they would see other children without parents. They would see other children living in this small, almost a, like a cabin, shack type of area. Six, seven people, two adults and four or five children living in that place. They would see these children not smiling because they didn't have a mom, mommy or daddy that loved them and cared for them. And Sam and David, because they grew up for years and years and years watching these type of things, it changed their life. It changed their perspective. So for them, living at home, even though their mom passed away, they're happy to have a daddy who loves them and cares for them and prays for them. Even though they may live in a small, cramped apartment compared to other people, they've seen people, children, who come from even worse situation, and they're just thrilled and they enjoy. It's a blessing for them to live in that type of apartment. Even though they may not eat expensive food or Korean food every day, they see that these children, some of them, they come from family where they haven't eaten for days. And so for them, eating cereal every morning, it is, a, it is joy and a blessing. Eating a, a, a dollar hamburger, it is a joy and a blessing. Even just simply to have a place to sleep, is a joy and a blessing. So Sam and David... No matter what the situation and circumstances, their hearts are always filled with joy and happiness. Why? Because their perspective was different than other children. Why? Because for years and years, they saw, they observed, 
something that was different, something that was good, something that changed their lives. You see, God has given us a life. You know, just this week, I saw a movie. It's called Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I know some of you have seen it. It's a long movie. I saw it. It's a movie about a, again, it's, it's, it's a fantasy movie. It's a movie, movie about a, a man, a boy that was born as an old man. And unlike others, he was born as an old man. And as time, as time passes, he gets younger, 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 and younger. And what made this story so interesting was that because of his situation, all the people that he knew, even though he was getting younger, all the people he knew as he was getting younger started dying and dying. And he started seeing and all these people pass away, relationship pass away. And watching this movie really made me think about really the importance of time and how valuable time was. And for us to live our lives not enjoying this precious time that God's given us, it is almost tragic. What a waste of time. Again, Bible tells us there are two ways in which we, can, we waste our time. Devoting our entire time and energy what, on building wealth, something that will not last, something that will disappear. And we waste time when we live our lives not enjoying the life, not being able to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. So I made a commitment this week, even as I was preparing the sermon, I made a commitment this week. I shared with you earlier that Saturday usually is the worst day for me. I age the most on Saturday because I worry so much. But I made a commitment that I wasn't going to worry. I made a commitment to focus on the people that are here. I made, a, I made a point, I made a decision to say, you know what, I'm going to enjoy just sharing the Word of God. I'm going to enjoy watching you know, people like Scott get better, and not just Scott, but others learn and grow. I made a commitment that I'm just going to enjoy the smiling faces of Dr. You know, Tube. Not just him, but all of you. I made a commitment you know what? I'm going to enjoy my wife and children even more. Because life is too precious. And I don't want to waste it. I'm going to continue to serve God. I'm going to continue to devote myself to build something that is eternal, not temporary. I'm going to enjoy the Bible study that we're going to, we started at Chunam University. Whether it's three people, ten people, or maybe it's just me. I don't care. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy seeing the students at Chungnam University. I'm going to enjoy my children more. I'm just going to enjoy my children more. I'm going to enjoy, watch this church grow. I'm going to enjoy sharing the love of God with others. I'm going to enjoy the snack afterwards. I'm going to enjoy the meeting the new people. Because life is too precious, and I don't want to waste it. Life is just too short and precious to waste it. Amen? Let us pray.